We can start anytime you're ready, Chair. Good morning, and welcome to the October 28th, 2021 Park and Recs Commission Luther Burbank Docks Subcommittee video meeting. I am Peter Strzok, Subcommittee Chair. In accordance with Proclamation 20-28.10 and the Governor's Extended Safe Start Order, this morning's Parks and Rec Subcommittee meeting is using video conferencing technology provided by Zoom. The Zoom video of this meeting is being recorded and will be will broadcast live via Zoom and will be uploaded to the city's YouTube channel uh, later today. City staff Paul West and consultants Andy Bennett and Anna Spooner are participating in this morning's meeting remotely. Other public audience members are listening to the meeting by, by telephone or via the internet. Welcome to all and thank you for joining us today. Commissioners, please turn on your microphones and will Paul uh, please uh, call the roll. The chair struck. Here. Commissioner Westberg. <laughs> and uh, Here. Former, commissioner, former Commissioner Galtieri. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, participants, before we start the business of this meeting, I want to suggest a few rules to help the meeting to run smoothly. We are going to be less formal than in full commission meetings. Please step in to speak when you sense that the previous speaker has finished. I ask that everyone be observant and allow members equal access to speak. You still may use the raise hand feature if you want to step into the conversation. Please mute your microphone if you do not anticipate speaking in the current discussion. Additionally, prior to speaking, please state your name for those listening in on the meeting. This morning's agenda will not include public appearances. However, individuals wishing to make comments on the subcommittee business today can use the comment feature on the Let's Talk project page or email Paul West, the project manager. The next regular meeting of the Park and Recreation Commission's regular meeting is on November 4th, 2021, next week, where there will be the opportunity to address comments to the full commission during public appearances via Zoom. And with that introduction, uh, our regular business agenda day will be comprised of uh, four topics. Uh, first, the presentation of a revised landscape plan. Next, a presentation of cost estimates for the project, uh, a permit, permitting issues update, and finally, uh, next steps uh, and meeting discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Paul West to move forward. You're on mute, Paul. Turning it over to Anna Spooner, who will uh, walk through uh, what has changed in the current plan set from the last time we discussed it. Okay, should I, um, this is Anna, and um, would you like me to share my screen? Yeah, that'd be great. All right, I have this up. One second. Actually, let me put it on this screen so I can still look into the camera. Great. Does everybody see my screen? Okay. So I'm going to just zoom in and I'm going to work from the north to the south um, and describe the changes. So at the, um, or excuse me, I'm gonna work from the south to the north. <laughs> um, so at the south end, um, this is probably the biggest change you'll see um, based on our last subcommittee. We took a second look at the grading to get the, um, the connection between the structural ramp that leads to the outdoor classroom um, all the way down to the plaza. So the, um, ramp here is unchanged. That's a structure that comes off the outdoor classroom to provide ADA access to that classroom. It's unchanged until it hits the uh, existing grade along this hillside. And at that point, previously, we had a um, circuitous concrete path that wound down directly to the plaza in this location where my hand is. 
but we revised that um, and we uh, now are proposing a pathway that comes down. It's a crushed gravel pathway with a maximum slope of 5%, which is an ADA slope that um, is a gradual slope and doesn't require handrails. So it's a gradual slope down uh, switchbacking and then it crosses the existing driveway in this location and continues down to um, connect in with the proposed South Shoreline Trail connection. At that point, you can continue traveling and then into the plaza area. This change um, requires that we also regrade a portion of the, of the driveway to allow for a flat ADA accessible connection here. Um, and we did this to um, kind of reduce the amount of grading and impacts in this area um, to connect into the South Shoreline Trail. And also we now have a crushed gravel instead of a concrete surfacing. So a pervious surface for that, that trail. Um, and in addition to that, we updated the planting areas associated with, with uh, this, this change in this design. Uh, as you move then into the plaza, um, this is uh, still proposed as concrete because we changed this to the crushed gravel surfacing. We maintain this as a um, concrete and then we, have, we still have the, um, the paver. So this area is pretty unchanged. As you head to the north, we included a new bench location here. Um, so we now have three benches within the plaza. And as you continue heading towards uh, the north, the change in this location is we included a new concrete seat wall bench integrated into the exist or the currently and previously proposed uh, rockery here. That's along the ADA pathway connection to the beach. And then we just noted um, at this uh, edge condition here, this is a, a concrete cap on a sheet pile wall that essentially functions as a step um, from the pathway to the, the beach. And we noted that this, the design of the, both the concrete step um, and edge and beach will accommodate mats that uh, the city will manage and, and um, operations will take care of that, but we will design it to accommodate those map, mats. Um, and then the other change that we made um, kind of holistically was we reviewed the number of trees and we confirmed um, that we have 20 trees to mitigate for the removal of trees on the site associated with the grading and other changes. Um, so I think that's all the changes. Did I, did I miss anything or does anyone have any questions? Go ahead, Lynn. I had a question again about the whole ADA and the paths and those rules. Um, so you said that it's crushed gravel. I'm assuming crushed gravel is, is ADA accessible? It is, yeah. We would design the crushed gravel mix to meet ADA accessibility requirements for compaction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Commissioner Westberg. I have a, a question about the, um, you answered most of them actually, but I had a one about the addition of the, uh, the concrete seat wall and just wondered since we've kind of gone out of our way to use natural materials in that area, you know, and uh, natural looking gravel for the pathway, natural looking stone, natural stone for the walls, whether there was an alternative to inserting uh, concrete into that particular location for a seat wall or whether in fact the height of the wall would just allow people to, to sit for a short period of time uh, in that area. Yeah, that's a good comment. And you must have uh, heard Paul and I talking about that last week because we had just that conversation last week. Um, and the idea of instead of using concrete, potentially using a larger um, natural stone cap um, and integrating that into the rockery design. So I think that that's definitely um, a little bit in flux as we kind of move from 30% into more detailed design to consider that. 
Um, but that's definitely something that Paul brought up um, and I echoed. And I think it's something that we could we could look into instead of having a, a concrete seat wall within the rockery, designing the rockery so you have um, a, maybe a, a larger natural stone slab um, that's more conducive to seating. Um, so I think it's a good comment and something that we can detail as we move in that direction. Okay, yeah, we must all be on the same wave, wavelength on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, I just uh, a comment on your your trees. Yes, I, I counted and I may have missed a couple that uh, nine trees would be removed, but we were replacing them with 20 uh, trees, all of which are native. So I think that's great. Yeah, and the tree counts um, for the proposed trees are on that uh, landscape schedule sheet, which I believe is the last sheet in the set. Uh, I won't move around to make us all dizzy, but um, yeah, that's where those counts are as well and, and just counting them. This is uh, Commissioner Struck. Uh, I have a couple of comments, uh, questions. Um, first, I think I, I counted 10 trees that are gonna be removed, not nine, but I, my math might've been wrong, but either way, uh, we're replacing, we're, doubling the amount of number of trees relative to what we have today and with better species, I believe as well, getting rid of the cottonwoods and so forth. Um, so kind of a general question, kind of looking at the existing site as it is today, are there any impervious surfaces that are actually being removed totally? Um, uh, it looks like there's some surfaces that are being uh, modified from impervious to pervious, um, but just curious if there's actually any surface being totally removed. Um, I believe the answer is no, we are modifying, as you say, okay. um, but there's no area um, where we're fully removing surfacing and, and replacing it with vegetation or another, another um, type of surface. We are the main place where we're changing the impervious to pervious is in the plaza area at the pavers, um, but all other areas with surfacing, um, for example, the concrete that's that's existing. We're either going from concrete to concrete or we're going from asphalt to concrete in this little area. Um, and then the gravel is remaining gravel on along the driveway. So your comment is correct. We're not we're not changing any surfacing to a, a vegetative surface or, or similar. Okay, but 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 you're right. But we are modifying, so that's that's a. We are that's overall. A we're, benefit, yeah, we're yeah. reducing, um, right. reducing that pervious. Yeah. Or excuse me, reducing impervious. Those two words. Yeah, and then um, looking at the the driveway, so. You kind of, there's just from the schematic there, and I don't know if there's a difference, but so in kind of on the on the furthest south, I guess, where it just it just says gravel and it's it's kind of blank, and then as you kind of move towards the plaza, it, it has that kind of graved in, and I, and I think the it says it still says gravel driveway paving. So is there a difference in the surface between those two sections? There is no difference. So the limits of the new gravel driveway paving, which is this kind of gray hatch with the black um, dots on it. That is defined by where we need to grade. So where we need to impact I that see, gravel driveway and where it's blank here, we're just gonna leave it as the existing condition and tie our grades and our new gravel into that condition. But the gravel that we're proposing will be very, very similar to the gravel that's out there. So it'll be a okay. seamless transition. Okay. And then Anna, when you, when you, in your, your presentation comments, you just made a comment that caught my, my, um, my ear. On the plaza, you said we're gonna maintain with concrete. So that implies to me is, do we have options there to go to a, a, a more pervious surface or is that really not, it may be for cost reasons or whatever, we're just gonna maintain? So what we talked about last time um, was that, you know, there was an inclination to have less concrete and less impervious paving. And previously we had, this pathway was concrete and then right. this area was concrete. And we talked about, hey, can this be crushed gravel? And could this, we integrate imper or excuse me, pervious concrete. And in response to that, we said, yes, actually this can be crushed gravel. And the reason why is because we reduce the slope, which accommodates a crushed surfacing. 
Here, um, we can change this to pervious paving. It's not currently proposed because of cost. Also, um, we're not creating a pollutant, a pollution generating surface. Like we're not, we're not treating actual um, pollution generating surfaces. Um, so while a benefit may be kind of visually kind of to the um, community, I don't think it actually serves a huge benefit to what we're doing in terms of stormwater. Um, also, it's more expensive. Also, there's maintenance, uh, ongoing maintenance for a pervious surface over time. Not a lot. And then also from an aesthetic standpoint, pervious paving, uh, con pervious concrete has a different aesthetic to just regular concrete paving. Uh, it's kind of more like popcorn and, and coarser. Um, so for those reasons, I maintained it, but there is an opportunity to change it to pervious. It's just not the recommendation currently. Okay. Um, I don't, do the, do the other two uh, committee members have any thoughts one way or the other? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I have a, just a, a question and it's not to appear to be contrarian or take us back, but anticipating that we might get this question and it's, refresh my memory, did at any point we consider to provide access to the class, rooftop classroom, putting in a lift in lieu of a trail? Was that part of our discussion? I have to look to Paul to answer that one. Um, no, that has not been discussed previously. That's the new idea. Um, and I'm just, I'm just anticipating, you know, that there might be questions about, you know, the, the extent to which we have to uh, expand a trail access. And personally, I, I like that. It, it's, to me, it kind of sits well on the landscape, but the question may well come up, why not just put a lift on? That would uh, that would uh, allow access to the rooftop, and would that be cheaper? We can. Uh, I think we could probably try to get uh, you know spend a little bit of time to, to answer that, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be um, possible. But it isn't. I, I don't. I don't think it would be any cheaper. You you've got the machinery that's got to would be there. You'd need to get. Um, you know, additional power, lifts are not cheap, and outdoor lifts are notoriously maintenance intensive. Yeah, I can imagine. And so, and, and the capacity, I mean, if, if you had a lift, unless it's a huge lift, which is, you know, even more expensive, you know, if that's the only way to get there and you've got a class of 30 people, when class is over, you're just going to have this, this queue of people right. waiting to go down three at a time in the lift. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of reasons not to do it. Um, that said, it's it's feasible. You could put it right there in the southeast corner, and you, know, you could have something like that. But um, it also yeah. Well, again, I'm not proposing it. I just yeah. I'm sort of anticipating. Well, somebody might bring that up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, this is Commissioner Stark again. Um, I, I can't see Lynn because uh, it's only five, so I don't know if she had any co additional comments. Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, about the the surface, the impervious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember we talked about that last time. I mean, so Anna, I appreciate your outlining. You know, sort of the pros and cons and cost and aesthetics seem like a large part of it, but. Um, yeah, and maintenance, but I, I mean, I guess it depends on how much of a priority we put on that, and then maybe we could find that money in the budget. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't know if we want to talk about that and, is, and is uh, the, redo is the, the budget. Is the issue around pervious pavement um, aesthetic, or is it more a concern of runoff and managing the stormwater? Because you know. As Anna mentioned, it's not a pollution generating surface. And so whatever falls on that surface either goes into the pervious pavement at the front or we collect it and, um, and direct it into the lake. But is there, you know, what, what, 
what are the trade-offs we're looking at in terms of the positives for doing the permeable pervious pavement versus we, we've identified the negatives, but what, what are the upsides that we're balancing that against? Yeah, I, I think the, the reason I, I, I just raised the, the issue was was more from, I guess, and that'd be the positive benefit type is just that I think that in the the community, there's just a growing, um, you know, desire to try to minimize uh, impervious surface as much as possible. And obviously, there's always trade offs. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I'm is I th I've thought about it here. I mean, I'm you know we've we've already done I think compared to the existing structure quite a bit of kind of uh, modifying uh, from impervious to pervious, uh, as well as now with the with the proposed um, trail from the classroom uh, as well. So I think we we've, we've done a great job there. But as I said uh, in the presentation when it said maintain, I just caught my caught my ear and thought, well maybe we should we should revisit that again. I. Um, other things being equal would probably prefer that, but I, I understand the cost. And, and the other thing would be is looking kind of at the aesthetics. Is there a by having uh, the, the the concrete pad, if you will, versus the uh, pavers around it and so forth? Is it, you know aesthetically is that a kind of a better look, um, if you will? And so that those are the kind of the offsets. So. <clears throat> Yeah, from aesthetics, I, I do I do think that um, it would be a better looking project for just thinking about the looks if it was clean um, paving, can concrete paving adjacent to the pavers. I think it would look really nice. Yeah, I, I, that's kind of as I thought about a little bit more here. That's kind of where I'm somewhat landing here. I guess it'd be great to have a picture itself, but I I think the the I, th I think you're correct. So, okay. Um, so let's put that one to bed. Um, any other uh, comments, observations, questions on this uh, kind of overview slide? Uh, yeah, this is this is uh, Commissioner Westberg. Not to beat a dead horse, but um, I think we can. I mean, we're already adding several, easily several hundred square feet of. Uh, non-pervious or non-pervious surface or pervious surface rather with the pavers. So I think, you know, we can, we can uh, look anybody squarely in the eye and say, with regard to this project, we've, we've done a good job at, look, at trying to keep it both functional and cost-effective, but also um, bearing in mind the, uh, the interest in, uh, not adding impervious surface where we don't have to. So I feel pretty good about the way it's shaped up. Besides, we have asphalt in that area now where the concrete pavers would go and it looks horrible. Any other, uh, you know, one thought or just to kind of point out, um, it, it kind of grabbed my eye a little bit more today than, than last meeting, but the, the new uh, granite steps to the, connecting to the existing trail. I think that'll be a nice uh, <coughs> feature add-on um, that uh, just to point that out. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, well, Peter, I did have one other question. And okay, that, good, uh, thanks. Sir. It, it more relates to the, the grading plan, but it, it's still kind of unclear to me how the steps work because on the grading plan, it didn't show that the steps were anchored to uh, support from the lake. And I, I think that's the way I remember us talking about it, that the steps would have to it's rest the, over water. Yeah. They would have to rest on some type of um, support. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Yes, they would. Uh, I don't know if Andy, if you want to talk to that, but I can, the section doesn't, capture the support and that's captured in some of the structural drawings which are not in this set. Um, okay. But uh, Andy, do you wanna talk about those pin piles? Yeah, I can, I've can. i actually got the, the set that shows that structural detail and um, I, can, I can share my screen and we can take a quick look at that if you like. I think I, yeah. I can, uh, that is screen one. 
stair. So this is this is what the structure of the stairs would look like. And basically we're using steel sections to minimize the size of the structure. So we're, we're maximizing light penetration. It's obviously gonna be a, a graded 60% um, open area grading. And then it's a steel frame. And we'd, we'd be using these six inch pin piles. Um, I think they'd be spaced about every 15 feet along the face of this. And pin files can be installed um, you know, the, with a lot less impact than driving, you know, when we talk about 10 inch or 12 inch steel piles or structural piles, you know, that's a, that's a, a noisy, loud operation. Pin piles go in a much, much e more easily um, here. So we've, we've got a few pin piles along the face of it, um, but that, that's how it would be held up. Thanks, Andy. I just, yeah, I thought I remembered that, but I didn't see it on the cross section. So I just wanted to confirm. Yep. Yep. And then Anna tells us where it goes and we tell us, tell the contractor how to hold it up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the next agenda item is the design 30% design cost estimate. So Paul, I'm not sure who will uh, kind of walk through that. I believe that's Andy. Um, can you take that one? Sure. And I can I'll, actually, I'll go right back to sharing my screen again. Uh, so this is this is the cost estimate summary that, that uh, you've had a chance to look at. And it's organized by grant application without specifically calling out the grant program that we're hoping to get funding for, for each element. Um, but we've got the, and the, the large power bolt mortgage is actually, that's the repairs to the North Pier. So that's why it's a, a, a smaller number than, than you might think. The, the biggest number is gonna be about a million bucks for that uh, power bolt mortgage. Actually, when we, we get into with the escalation and sales tax and everything else, um, that power bolt mortgage gets to be a little bit expensive. And a lot of that is driven by the fact that it is also providing wave attenuation um, to protect the inner float, um, which we think is, is important for the safety of, and the, you know, the access on that inner float. Since we're, we really want that to be accessible and, and safe to use for all kinds of people. Um, and so that's why it's, it's more expensive is it, it does have that. It's, it's got a lot more structure to it, a lot more weight to it to provide that wave attenuation. The inner float, the non-powered watercraft moorage is, you know, it's, it's not a stock item, but it's something that, that um, you know, marina contractors and float builders, um, it's, it's pretty common for them to build things like this. It's relatively lightweight. Um, and so that's why it's really not that expensive. The access improvements, that's really the stairs. And they're, you know, they're not very expensive. Um, the design of those is going to be, you know, a little bit more expensive. Um, but as you saw in that structural section, there's, there's really not a lot to them. So we, we think we get a lot of benefit from that. Um, stormwater management, there's just, there's a lot of grading and grading the, um, the silver cells we want to have. We need to do some research on whether or not we can actually make silver cells work. They're designed for a minimum depth of, of the cell that's, that's above the water table. And in the summer, when the lake is at high level, we don't have that much depth. In the wintertime, we've got plenty of depth. And so we got to work with the silver cell people to see how viable that will be in terms of going forward um, with the silver cells. That's a, a good chunk of the stormwater improvements. Um, and these other projects are things for which we have not identified grant sources yet. I'm not saying they don't exist, but of the, the grants we have identified, these don't quite fall into those. And so we got the plaza improvements um, the pavers are part of the permeable pavement, and so they fall into the stormwater management. So in terms of plaza improvements, 
um, there is a distinction there. So that that piece has moved over to stormwater. Um, we've got the new ramp that we talked about, and then the, within the building, we did break out the outdoor classroom, the access ramp, um, and just the way this worked out. Um, Jim at, at Cardinal Architects, he gave me a fully burdened all in cost estimate. And so I had that included contingencies, mobilization, sales tax, escalation. And so I just used his numbers here and, and carried them over instead of trying to break them out and add them back in. It's, like, it's just a little cleaner this way. So that, that's why you've got gray there. Um, but provided that outdoor classroom, you know, it's close to $200,000 to to get that improvement. The other improvements are the restrooms and um, and the other things that are going on in the building. Uh, so the, the outdoor classroom is not a cheap item, but it's not ridiculously expensive either. We're doing some irrigation intake work. Uh, we're making the North Beach, you know, providing access to the, to the North Beach, um, furnishings and planning. So those, those are the elements, that's how we've broken it out. We did provide 1% of the total of everything else as an integrated art budget. Um, we know that that's important. And so we've just kind of rolled that in um, and it carries across. And so we can you know, see we're, we're looking at a total, total program budget of around 4 million. Um, and we can get, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, most of that is going to come from grant sources, but there's, um, there are some big chunks that are not, not going to be, you know, we haven't identified grants for yet. I think, is that safe to say, Paul, or, or are we committed to, um, to the city paying for those? Um, well, let, let's, let me delve into the grants a little bit more, but, okay. uh, um, I'll just go cut to the chase and say uh, my initial back of the napkin calculation on what we could get for grants is about 2 million. So it's going to be roughly half that I think we can get. Um, we've already got this, this, I'm going back up to the first line now, the large power boat moorage. That's already, that's an approved grant. We've got $500,000 uh, budget uh, with a $371,000 grant uh, to, to construct that. So that's baked. Um, the small powerboat mortgage, which is a million seven, um, we can get a, uh, we can get up to a million dollars in a boating facilities program grant for that. Um, uh, and then water for the for waterfront access improvements, um, that's, uh, there's grant programs for that. And then the storm water management, uh, item, which seems really high, um, that actually we can get that entirely grant funded through, um, a dedicated fund, uh, from, uh, drainage rate payer, uh, uh, uh program that, that, it, that King County runs. So, that 517 is, is potentially 100% funded by that um, uh, rate funded uh, money. So that's that you know that, that adds up you know somewhere in the on the order of two million, and uh, I think it's gonna you know I think getting much more than two million is gonna yes like Andy said we're gonna have to look for opportunities. The outdoor classroom we might we might be able to get. I mean, not the outdoor classroom, the, uh, the restrooms actually, which seem fairly pedestrian. Actually, um, some of these um, grant programs that uh, fund waterfront access consider restrooms part of the waterfront access. So we have to take a look at that and see if we can roll the restrooms into the waterfront access improvements. And if we do, bingo, you know, that's another chunk of money that we can apply for. Um, but the remaining, the remaining, uh, say, say we get two million in grants. That means there's two million of city funds of some sort, whether it's existing funding through uh, our CIP fund that's refunded, or um, what's being talked about as a levy or a bond issue. Um, those are, you know, some of the variables that are uh, 
being discussed at the, the city manager's level and in, in the in the Parks and Rec Commission, I think we'll be taking that up too um, as the pros plan moves forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee members, any questions? Uh, this is Commissioner Westberg. I just have one question and that is could uh, the Silva cell, since that's a high cost component of the stormwater management improvements, was there, was the function of the Silva cells primarily stormwater related or was it related to the viability of the plantings on the plaza? I can't quite remember. I think it's both. Um, I'll just um, uh, say that um, the cells, uh, so when you have when you have the, the um, when you have the silver cells as uh, under the pavement, it it um, it allows the tree roots to grow under the pavement without buckling the pavement, and it provides mm -hmm. volume that normally trees planted in tree pits don't have. In other words, they normal tree pits on the street only have the volume of soil in that cutout in the sidewalk. Uh, the silver cell extends under the pavement and gives the tree adequate rooting volume to become a mature, healthy tree. Um, and that, that would result in a long-lived tree, which is what I think we want. Um, but, the, but the silver cell, the, the water is, uh, I mean, the silver cells are also considered a, a low impact development technology where they allow stormwater to be filtered and um, and you know they, they reduce sediment, reduce oxygen demand on on the on the lake and so forth. So um, they they function uh, in that way as well. It's, it, you can't say that it's just one benefit there. Okay, thanks, Paul. And I think one thing, and, and I know. And then we've talked about this is, is when we pick the tree there, the, the tree that you pick to go in there is a tree that can handle wet roots because during the summer, the, you know, the ground level, the groundwater level is going to be, you know, up, up there close to the surface. Right. You know, it's, you know you, right. you've all been there, you know, where the water is in the summer and essentially it's that high under the, under the plaza as well. Um, yeah. So yeah. Paul and I collaborated on that tree selection and it's a, uh... It's a meta sequoia, which is a very cool tree and it does well with water and um, it will be kind of like a interesting tree that I know when I see them out in Seattle, I get really excited. So hopefully others will as well. <laughs> Lynn? I, I had a question, um, Paul, sorry, if you already mentioned this about the outdoor classroom, like potential grant for that. Did you mention any potential sources funding for that? You're right. I, I started to talk about the outdoor classroom and then I stopped because I know I don't have any um, good idea about the outdoor classroom um, for grant funding. Um, you know, I, I would have to, you know, I, I think that there's a little more research to look at some of these grant sources and see what they've funded in the past and see if there's anything like that outdoor classroom that's been successfully funded to see if it might be eligible. Um, but it doesn't strike me as directly related to the water the way some of these other components are. Um, the, the need for it is not as, uh, I mean, we'd have, we could make a case for the need for it. I think, I think the subcommittee understands the need for it, but making the case for the need is, might be a little more obscure than some of these other elements. So I just, I just don't, I know. So the answer is no, I don't have a good idea there right now. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think maybe someone should look into that. I mean, maybe like REI, Outdoors for All, organizations like that, they might support something related to an outdoor classroom, especially these days, you know, where we all got pretty crea creative, not being inside in a classroom anymore. You know, mm -hmm. we can we prove that we can do things outside. And so, I don't know, I, I was just thinking maybe there could be 
we could do a special ask in the community for that. You know, someone would probably love to have their name on that, or REI probably would. Anyway, just an idea. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Those are good, actually great ideas. Um, I'll take a turn here. This is Commissioner Strzok. Um, Andy, I, I, maybe you're the best. So just kind of, I'm looking more for definitions. So the estimated contractor cost column, how is that derived, those numbers? Uh, all right, so this PDF is just a one page. Basically, we break down how many cubic yards of concrete do we need? How many pounds of steel do we need? How many square feet of painting are there? And then we'll estimate how many hours we think it, it's going to take to install it or fabricate it. And so um, it's a combination of, of volume, quantities of material costs, unit pricing for the material cost, and then labor hours that, that go into either fabricating it offsite or constructing it, installing it on site. Um, I think the, the total cost estimate is, you know, at, at this point, you know, we're, we're still pretty early in the design. So it's not as detailed, which is why we've got, you know, a good design contingency in there. Um, but but for each of these items, there are, are lots of sub elements um, that, that okay. go into it. Okay. So I, I guess so. I, I guess I was saying you see, so you didn't actually you you basically use kind of uh, existing sources for pro you didn't actually go to a contractor and say here are the drawings, give me a you know a no. bid. You just said you know, based on various cost source sourcing documents, et cetera, that, yep. you know, like you said, amount, amount of time and so forth, you came up with those numbers. Okay, yeah, got and, it, and thank at, you. At this, at this point, you know, we've, we've got enough data from other projects and, and we do right. keep, keep close tab, track of all the bid tabs. So when we bid, it, when we put together an estimate, it goes out the state or whoever gets the, the bids, we look at those bids and you know, update our numbers and our unit values based on the latest data that we've got. And so um, you know, that's that's our, our method. Um, generally, it works pretty well. We've got a, a yeah, decent record. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one other uh, question, uh, the column, what is mobilization? I, I, I mean, I understand design commit contingency and construction contingency, I believe, but that's, that's mobilization the, is- That's the effort for the contractor to get his gear together and move his um, move his team onto site. Depending on the duration, it might involve you know renting a construction trailer for six weeks. So he's got a construction office on site for the marine work. It involves the cost of of getting his uh, derrick barge or other marine equipment from wherever it happens to be to the site. Um, so it, it's 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 getting things to the site as well as kind of just ramping up. Um, there's work that they need to do in terms of, you know, making sure they've got a project specific safety plan, pollution prevention plans and all that kind of work that the contractor has to do before they show up. And so it's, it's a pretty broad range. And, and um, as we get into more detail and we understand more specifically what equipment might be needed, we can refine that number, but typically 10% covers those costs. So uh, I, I know we're kind of at the 30% stage. Um, so kind of as you move to 60, 90, you know, whatever. Um, just from your experience, does, so the will the design, design contingency, mobilization, construction contingency, maybe not the mobilization from what you described, but will those kind of start to, decrease a bit as you kind of say, well, now I've got more specificity. We're getting closer to a project start date. Yeah. And yeah. It'll, it'll, they'll, whatever the numbers are, they'll kind of morph over to the actual contract cost. Yeah, the design contingency will definitely come down. And you know, when, when we go out to bid, the design contingency is zero because we know everything we're gonna know about the design. Um, the mobilization number, instead of being a 10%, might be broken down into to more specifics. Construction contingency, um, you know, in a lot of our work with washtop, we don't really play with that too much. It just, you know, there are things happen during construction that we can't right. control. And so we just kind of leave that in there. That also can, can include some change orders. 
um, that kind of thing that, that happens during construction. Um, so the design contingency definitely will come down as, as we know more about the project um, and the other numbers will be refined. And if we, if we think, you know, there's a, if we have reason to believe we've got a really tight contract package, you know, maybe we'll come down the construction contingency a little bit, but probably not too much. Right, yeah. Well, and, and thank you for that. I, I was just trying to kind of understand as we, uh, for the community as we kind of move through this, you know, we've got a essentially right now a probable cost of, you know, $4 million and kind of, you know, given that we have a lot of uncertainty today uh, or some amount of uncertainty, I wouldn't say a lot, but some amount of uncertainty that you know, that number may go down may go up we'll just you know we'll just have to to wait and see as as we get more uh, we, we get further along in the project so thank you for that yeah and um, the, the escalation you know three-year escalation of 8.36 percent is is actually higher than it had been but it's greatly influenced by all of the recent logistics issues that we're facing and we're seeing costs go up across the board because of that and so you know a year from now Hopefully there won't be 70 some container ships parked off LA and supply and demand will be better aligned. And so, you know, that escalation is, is another number that we'll keep track of as, as we keep moving forward. Great. Okay, um, let's see if I hear any. All right, um, any other comments, questions, observations on this? slide. Okay, hearing none, um, I think we'll close this one out then. And, and I believe the next item is uh, an update on permitting issues, Paul. You're muted, Paul. I don't think any. Sorry, I've got I got a phone going up and I can't figure out this. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, permitting. Uh, we just want to give a brief update. Um, there, the um, Andy and Anna can probably do that better than I can, um, but um, I think this the basically there we're we're looking at a little more complication. The permitting is um, as we started to talk about last time and I'll just let them do a little bit more uh, fleshing out of that and uh, it'll influence what we decide to do for our next meeting. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it, Andy, unless you want to. Um, yeah, you know, based, I'll just reiterate what Paul said is, you know, as we got into this, we had a good meeting with the, um, shoot, now I've got a phone <laughs> going off that I can't. Oh, where is it? Hold on just one second. Decline. There you go. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, yeah, we, we so we'll interrupt we, for a second. Um, um, Commissioner Westberg is trying to get back into the meeting. He got kicked out. Oh, oh, I was wondering what happened there. So hopefully he'll be back in any minute. All right. I'll. I think maybe you go ahead and I'll try to reach him. Okay. So yeah, you know, we we had a good meeting with the, all the, the folks from the city of Mercer Island who's going to, who are going to review the permits, and we had a good discussion uh, about some of their requirements and some of the, the questions that we had and that they had about the project. Um, so we're we're moving ahead with that, um, but we're also moving ahead with the agency that uh, a big part of the permitting is going to be the all the in-water work and there's a bunch of different agencies as you know that get involved in, in issuing those permits and so we put together a list of, of people and contacts who want to begin the initial outreach to those agencies now and I think Anna that's kind of what your team's going to pick up and and move forward on on that part of the strategy. Yeah, exactly. So looking at both local and then also state and federal 
um, and make sure that we're thinking about the project holistically and getting some early input from all the different agencies to um, best have a good strategy to get through the permitting. Um, so, yeah. And so we, oh, oh, I was just gonna say, I just could keep talking. <laughs> In the absence of talking, I just keep talking. Um, so we're looking to have an early agency, actually like on-site meeting um, to bring everyone out there, which is a really great way to introduce the project um, to you know, kind of get in front of um, any questions or concerns and, and talk through those on the site with um, a conceptual plan. Um, and, uh, and we'll hopefully do that you know, before the end of the year. See that Commissioner Westberg is, uh, looks he's like back. he's coming back in. It let me back in. <laughs> okay. All right. After kicking me out, I don't know why. Sorry well, about in that. Your absence, we just got we got a a, a brief update uh, from Anna and Andy about the uh, permitting uh, issues, and they're uh, working with the uh, relevant uh, local and state agencies to uh, move the project uh, forward. Um, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. Uh, perhaps you know at our next meeting we'll get another update. Um, Paul. Uh, any other topics or issues uh, for today's meeting? Um, none that I know of, unless the um, committee members have uh, new things they would like to discuss. I, I think uh, we want to talk about the next meeting date, which I'll let you guide us on. Okay. Um, well, with that, uh, the for the next subcommittee meeting, I, I think that uh, we're looking at early December and, and perhaps I, I guess the best way to do it would be to, um, you know, by email. And then once we, everybody has agreed upon a date, um, obviously the city then can publish that, that meeting date. I, um, I'm not sure it's probably, uh, the best use of time at this point to try to <laughs> sausage make, uh, what the next meeting date is, if you will. So with that, I'd like to thank all involved with, that served on the, on the subcommittee, as well as, um, uh, the consultants, Anna and Andy, uh, for all of their, their uh, effort uh, in this project as we move forward. Uh, the time is now 10.58 and the meeting is adjourned. However, as a reminder to participants, please stay seated until the city staff has terminated the, the Zoom broadcast. Again, uh, thank you for your time this morning and stay, stay safe and healthy.